Hi, everyone. So uh, yeah, there's no way I could give a better introduction about myself than Dave gave to me. So um, all of this basically boils down to I aspire to be the world's largest marketing technology nerd. Uh, just fascinating combination of uh, all the geeky, wonderful stuff about software. I'm a software engineer by training. Uh, actually have written some code. I'll deny it if shown that code these days, but yes. Um, but I've always been fascinated by how this intersects in the digital world with the experiences that we're delivering to our audiences. I guess one thing I'm known for is uh, this crazy graphic. Um, I'm always embarrassed to share this in front of a room of designers. Uh, one of my heroes, uh, Stephen Few, uh, information design guru, amazing fellow, wrote a blog post about this, and I believe he used the word abomination. Uh, so uh, if, you, if you have tips for me afterwards, yes, we should talk. But what this is, it's a representative sample of nearly 3,500 marketing technology vendors in the world. What's crazy is not just that there's 3,500 today, but how quickly this space has evolved. When I first started charting this out in 2011, I found around 150 marketing technology companies. A year later, I found 350. Two years later, it was up to 1,000. That was up to 2,000. At this point in time, everyone was assuring me, OK, this is crazy. There's no way a software industry is going to have 2,000 vendors like that. It's going to consolidate. And I was like, thank goodness, because it's actually becoming a lot of work to move these little logos around on this page. Um, but 2016 wasn't the year for that. It continued to grow and expand. And if there's one thing I would want you to take away from this, it's that this is a shadow. This is a, a representation of just the scale of change that is happening in marketing today. Very hard to quantify that. We all feel it. You know? And this is by no means the entirety of the change. But seeing this explosion in marketing technology is one way to give us a quantified sense of just how much the world is changing. The uh, folks at Signal did a survey about a year or so ago, and they asked marketers, how, how do you feel the marketing technology landscape is evolving? And I love that 61%. It's evolving rapidly. Rapidly, all right, very visceral term. 6% said it's evolving at light speed. I mean, that's, that's really fast. You know, the geeky Star Trek portion of me is like, oh, awesome, light speed. I knew these things would come together. I'm dying to meet the 3% who said not much. I'm actually a little bit worried about them. So if, if you know one of them, please seek medical attention. But to be honest, all this marketing technology is in many ways the least interesting thing that's happening in marketing today. But, uh, there's a lot of debate, insider baseball, around this blue line of, OK, well, how many marketing technology vendors are there going to be? What is sustainable? What's going to consolidate? It's a fun discussion. You can do great drinking games over it. Um, but to me, the much more exciting thing is what well, I'm trying to capture in this green line, this idea that forgetting about the number of vendors, really focusing on how are organizations leveraging these capabilities. This, I think we would all agree, we're still in the very, very early days. And it's all about change. So speaking of change, ever play the fun little game, Name That Profession? It's, it's really easy. It's easier than the exercise you just went through, I promise. Um, so I put some words in two circles. Uh, you know, analytical, creative, programming, design, automation, experience, just sort of a word association. And I want you to take a guess, which one of these circles represents marketing? And which one of these circles represents software development? I know, it should be pretty easy. It's obviously the one here on the left is marketing today. Uh, and everyone in software is actually very concerned with user experience, design, the creativity of the art, which is actually true. Of course, this is usually where people object, like the, the rules of this game are just flawed because, right, you know, in reality, what's happening is both of these professions 
have all of those characteristics mingled together. And that unto itself is kind of a wild change, right? I mean, it wasn't that long ago. If you talk to your high school guidance counselor, you know, and the career spectrum of engineers and marketers, they were kind of on opposite ends of the spectrum. You know, one sort of test we could do is the, the laugh test, like which humorist do you like best? Like if you've ever read uh, XKCD, and you find that funnier, or if you've ever read uh, Mark Atunas, Tom Fishburne, you know, and you find that funnier. So whichever one of those pieces of humor resonates with you, that's sort of where you sit in that curve. But what's fascinating today is there's a lot of people who actually get both of these. This is the thesis uh, for a book I wrote this year called Hacking Marketing that essentially said, you know, in this digital environment, as more and more of what marketing is doing is powered by software, and in many ways, marketers are also one of the key stakeholders in building software. What are some of the ideas and concepts from the software world that we might be able to borrow and adapt to marketing management? And a good chunk of the book is actually focused on uh, agile management practices. Um, I suspect most of you in the audience are familiar with these. But it's been fascinating to watch Agile, which really you know, took off in the software community as a way of moving from sort of these, these long, tightly planned 12, 18 month software projects that inevitably ended up someplace very different uh, than where they imagined they, they started with, to this way of building software around Agile sprints of doing it in a more iterative fashion, of being able to incorporate more feedback from stakeholders and users and get a more evolutionary approach to building software. Well, what's fascinating is we're seeing marketers increasingly adopt a lot of these ideas because that waterfall method was actually a lot of how we used to run marketing, the yearly marketing plan with a very rigid plan. And increasingly now, Marketing is taking advantage of this operation of two-week, three-week, four-week sprints. Sometimes they don't call them sprints. You know, each marketer sort of chooses what language they want to adopt for this. But conceptually, marketing is embracing this. It's operating in many of the same ways as we see software development. So stepping back for a moment, um, to grossly oversimplify, I would say the history of marketing has been about the intersection of messages and media. Right? What we want to say to a particular audience and then how and where that message is going to appear. Uh, you know, nod to Marshall McLuhan. This is the art of communication. And phenomenal innovation, right? I mean, marketing's just done phenomenal things at the intersection. But what's always exciting to me is that in this digital environment, there is definitely a third dimension. Because I'm a nerdy guy who likes alliteration, I call these things mechanisms which is increasingly marketers are thinking not just about what it says or how and where it appears, but how does it function? How does it behave? How does it flow? And when we start talking about marketing taking on more and more of this mantle of customer experience, right? these are the issues we start to work through. And now we compare this to the world of software, which to grossly oversimplify too, we could say is this collision of three things, right? The data that we operate on, the UI, the interface that we provide to the world, the code, the mechanisms that tie all these things together. And the intersection of these three things has really been where the practice of user experience rests. How do we pull these together into a collective experience? So this is a domain in software products where product managers you know, play a big role. And so you now compare these side by side, and there are a lot of parallels. I mean, it's not just, all right, it's partly because I drew it that way, yes, all right, but it's not just because I drew it this way, right? I mean, when marketing is getting involved in building out these more and more sophisticated websites and mobile apps, you know, even these like interactive nurture campaigns through marketing automation, right? They are essentially working with data UI and code. And this overlap between user and experience and customer experience really are identical in those cases. 
So one of the first people to advocate for this was Ray Velez, uh, the CTO of Razorfish, who suggested that in a world like that, where you have those mechanisms, marketing managers should actually start to think more like product managers, where those touch points that they have with customers, these digital touch points at all these various places throughout the, uh, the marketing universe, that we treat them like little products. We evolve them the way product managers work with software teams to evolve them. We really think about shaping the evolution of that experience. And it becomes increasingly that role of understanding for and advocating for the users. One example of this uh, in uh, the work I uh, do with a company called Ion Interactive, we make software for interactive content. Uh, this has been one of the places where I've seen this in practice. That content marketing is very big today, but a lot of content marketing has fallen in this category of passive content, right? You read, you watch, you listen, which is great, amazing stuff here. But increasingly, we're seeing marketers experimenting with interactive content, where they're trying to build things that the audience actively participates in, whether it's simple quizzes or assessment tools or solution finders and starting to watch marketers go through this process of recognizing that the creative dimension they have for thinking about the service, the utility, the flow, the experience that they're bringing to these customers, that this really becomes a fascinatingly creative, uh, new creative dimension for marketing. It also puts marketing in the position of having to balance a lot more innovation. Marketing always had a great relationship with innovation, but it was usually one where, you know, the product team, you know, the, the, the business would come up with a new version of the product and they'd bring it to marketing. Uh, here's our innovation. And marketing would be like, fantastic. Okay, use my words, new and improved. I love it. But now, right, I mean, marketing is actually having to do a fair amount of innovation itself. We're having to find new ways to identify, reach, engage prospects and customers through all these new touch points. And so I find this an interesting challenge for marketers because right, we're in a state here where classically marketing has been responsible for a lot of scalable activities. How do we scale communications to the world? How do we scale you know, getting our message out? Which is great, we still have those responsibilities as marketers, but now we also have these responsibilities for innovating a lot of those communication and experience touch points. But when you compare those responsibilities side by side, right, there's a bit of a dichotomy. I mean, you know, in one case, you're being asked to experiment. When you talk about scalability, very quickly people want to standardize, you know, explore, exploit, fail fast versus don't fail question assumptions versus leverage assumptions. As marketing finds itself in this middle of trying to balance these two types of management activities, this is actually a bit of a paradox. How do you do it? Well, one of the ideas I talk in the book is stealing another concept uh, from the IT world, actually, uh, that the folks at Gartner had promoted a number of years ago when IT was trying to figure out, as agile practices were coming you know, into their heyday, how do we manage IT? Because there are some things IT does that, quite frankly, are long-term, infrastructure-oriented, capital budgeting projects that benefit from a certain amount of that waterfall planning. But at the same time, they had also a bunch of activities and demands from the business for building new software innovations that really did work very well with Agile. So how do we, how do we balance these? And Gartner came along and said, well, stop trying to manage every project the same way. But the straightforward answer was to have two ways of managing. Identify whether a project is more in that infrastructure scalability side or whether if it's more in the agile innovation side and manage it accordingly. And so this is an idea that, yeah, I mean, we could just shamelessly steal change from bimodal IT to bimodal marketing and talk about looking at marketing activities through this lens as well that not every marketing activity should be managed the same way. And I divide them up into this uh, nomenclature of the core, which is really what I see as the scalable activities that marketing is doing. It's proven, it knows how it's doing, it's optimizing, it's an operational role. And then this edge area, 
where we're exploring with new innovations. I choose the ratio 70-30 between these uh, because of uh, an article about uh, Coca-Cola where they had talked about dividing essentially 70-20-10 between budget spent on core marketing activities versus more emergent and experimental ideas. The 70-30 split doesn't matter, whether it's 80-20, 90-10, 60-40. What matters, though, is that key concept from bimodal IT of not managing every marketing activity in the same way. Another idea we can uh, use this core and edge metaphor for is thinking about, well, all those crazy marketing technology tools, they tend to get incorporated into marketing organizations as marketing stacks. This is the marketing stack of my company, ION. The uh, colorful band through the middle is essentially our core technologies that we leverage, you know, our CRM, our marketing automation system, CMS. But then we have all these more experimental edge technologies that we adopt, we pilot, we try, particularly a lot of things in social, a lot of things in some of these new sales innovation tools out there. That's great. The rigor we go through in selecting a CRM and a map is a very different process than the rigor we use for trying out a new social media tool. And this isn't just my company. Um, one of the reasons uh, that uh, slide is so beautifully designed for a marketing, uh, for a technology stack, right, uh, is with the MarTech conference I run, I have a little contest where I invite marketers to send in these single slide diagrams of what their marketing tech stack looks like. And it's not just about which products they use. It's really a challenge to say, can you help us visualize the purpose, the meaning, the vision behind why you have that stack. And if you get a chance, I mean, all these stacks are available for free. Uh, they're up on SlideShare. Just Google MarTech Stackies. Um, and some really fascinating examples of how different companies are doing this. But one of the common themes you'll see throughout it is this difference between the core and the edge. Core technologies and then enhancements with things around the edge. I had to give a shout out to uh, Connective DX. They actually won one of these stackies here for uh, the, this past year's contest. Um, so if you corner Jeff here at some point, yeah, he's, he'll be happy to tell you about it, I've told, so. All right, one last topic I wanted to share with you. Uh, this is the cover of the book, How Buildings Learn, by Stuart Brand. Some of you may be familiar with this. Um, the pictures on the front, um, the one on the left is the illustration of two buildings uh, that were built in the early 20th century, and then the photo on the right uh, is those exact buildings, like 70 years later. And you can see, even though they started out identical, they each took their own unique path to becoming incredibly ugly. <laughs> so, Brand got really fascinated by this, this idea that buildings evolve because right? we don't usually think of buildings, you know, we think of them as these more permanent structures. But they do evolve. And Brand uh, built on some ideas from an architect named Frank Duffy about recognizing that buildings actually evolve in different layers. Those different layers evolve at different rates. Right? Like there's the foundation on which we build uh, the structure that hopefully doesn't change very often, depending on where you are with tectonic plates. Um, you know, on top of that, there's the foundation. If it's done well, it should last hundreds of years. Then you get into, like, the, you know, exterior of the building. You start to get into services and internal space plan and then things like furniture and art, plants. My plants die every week, so they change a lot. Um, and all of these, as you go in, they change at faster and faster rates. Interesting. So what was the takeaway from that? Well, one of the takeaways from it was this change happens. We cannot stop it. But recognizing that this change is going to happen, we can actually design buildings to facilitate it. And we can design the slower changing layers, right? Like, for instance, we can design the way services are laid out in a building to facilitate changes in, say, the interior space plan. As an interesting aside, apparently, uh, about 10 years after that, I believe, uh, Stuart Brand uh, met up with uh, the musician Brian Eno, and they sketched out this idea of applying these pace layerings to civilization. 
Uh, you know, again, civilization has very slow-moving nature and then faster changing culture, governance, infrastructure, commerce, fashion. I really have no idea what you're supposed to do with this other than, I mean, how many times do you get to talk about Brian Eno? I mean, it's just like, hey, yeah, that's kind of cool. Um, but actually, going back to the good folks at Gartner, they did have an idea about what to do with this. That they recognized this pattern in IT systems. That IT systems are constantly changing, but they don't all change at the same rate. And they identify these three different layers of systems of record, like core data. And then on top of that, then systems of differentiation, sort of things that are unique to the operation of your business, but they do change faster. All the way up to these systems of innovation, which were very often things being requested by the marketing department, just in our side, you know, that could change very rapidly, right? New things we want to add on the website. And in many ways, the takeaway is the same thing from uh, brands, you know, how buildings learn, which is you can't stop this change. But once you recognize these things are changing at different layers, you can design them to facilitate the faster changing ones with the lower changing ones. And so while I was researching this, I was looking around to see, hey, is there a, uh, has anyone ever done a pace layering model for marketing? And I couldn't find one, so I took a shot at this myself. Um, right, like we have marketing associated with our company. Corporate culture, values, image, this is sort of the foundation, right? It, once it's established, it doesn't change quickly. Very similar to that are with, you know, individual brands, their positioning and value proposition. And on top of that, we get to campaigns that we do in brands, right? This is the fun stuff in marketing, uh, concepts, audiences, messaging. Now we start to get to something that has a schedule calendar that we measure in months. Then we map those campaigns into different channels, right? You know, everything from the media mix to framing the context uh, for a campaign in different channels. Now you start to get a schedule that is measured in weeks, how things change. And then we get to the actual tactics, right? The individual communications and experiences that we create. And it wasn't too long ago that that would have been the top of the stack, right? That would be the fastest changing thing in marketing was what new tactic did we want to try. But in this digital environment, things have really accelerated. We have two layers on top of that. We have these things called iterations, right? Now, thanks to A-B testing, Multivariate testing, personalization, right? Now, within a tactic, we're seeing this optimization that can happen in a matter of days, depending on your traffic. But we have even faster moving than that, this now real-time feedback from all these digital systems, whether it's coming at us in social media, or it's through the dashboards that we've instrumented. So what do we do with this? Right? Is this uh, like how buildings learn? Like there's something useful here? Or is it just sort of like a Brian Eno thing? God, I don't think I, did I just compare? Yeah, Brian Eno, okay, yeah, out of my league. Um, I would argue it's more like the Gartner thing. It's more like brand. That once we start to recognize that marketing is changing, this is the single biggest challenge for us, is all the different change we're wrestling with that by starting to identify this change happening in different layers, and these pace layers that are focused on what we're actually delivering out to the world, is one way to look at how do we define marketing strategy, marketing operations, marketing technology stacks. How are they built to facilitate faster change in tactics with a more stable consistency to how the brand represents itself? In fact, you could argue, marketing technology really isn't any different than any other IT technology. You can look at uh, Gartner's, you know, three layers, systems record, systems of differentiation, systems of innovation, and apply that as well to website design, marketing data. In fact, actually, uh, a number of you are probably familiar with Jesse James Garrett, you know, some of his early pioneering work and thinking about how, how, how websites get built. And when I came across this again, I was thinking, you know, there's a lot of echoes of similarity here to how buildings learn as well, too. This is the most exciting thing happening in marketing today, is change and this new intersection that we've got between the worlds of marketing and software is giving marketers a whole new range of ideas for how we manage that change. Thanks for having me.